amazing. I feel, she, I feel Monica laid out questions that each of us needs to answer for a lot of movements, not just in Wisconsin. Um, our next speaker needs little introduction, John Nichols. Um, I'm sure many of you feel, as I do, that this is the voice that we kind of listen to on the airwaves to really get the daily updates on what was going on in Wisconsin, and thank you, John, for that tremendous reporting. John is a, pioneer, a pioneering political blogger. He's written The Beat since 1999 for The Nation magazine as its Washington correspondent. He's a contributing writer for The Progressive and In These Times and the associate editor of The Capital Times, the daily newspaper in Madison. His articles have appeared in The New York Times, Chicago Tribune, and dozens of other papers. He's also the author of The S Word, A Short History of an American Tradition, Socialism, as well as many other books. John Nichols. Thank you. I'm going to call immediately on my friend Molly Stentz. Where's Molly? Where are you? Come on down here, Molly. Come on, come on down. Come on, Ed. Want you to, as she comes out, I'm going to give her a duty here, but we give a huge round of applause to the news director for our community radio station in Madison, Wisconsin, Molly Stentz. Hey, hey. Molly, Molly, because everybody who wants to talk about this struggle over talks, including myself, I'm sure, um, my phone is going to ring in, in a few minutes. And, uh, and I'm going to give you my phone, and you're going to answer it, and, and you're going to talk to the person on the other end, tell them you're the head of the community radio station, you're filling in with me until, and you're going to do a great job, okay? But before you do that, can you just shout it out and tell, give us uh, one minute of what Ward's been doing, because it's, uh, come on up here, come and stand by me for one second, I apologize, I'm hijacking, I'm so sorry. But if you didn't know the role of community radio in this struggle, you're missing out on a lot, so please welcome Molly Stead. thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people really felt the importance of independent media at a time like this. Um, I work for a radio station, WORT, we're uh, independent grassroots, non-commercial media, non-profit media, and my plane landed, I was covering the World Social Forum in Senegal actually, um, and my plane landed on the 14th as I came back from the World Social Forum and found, you know, I, that my state was in crisis um, and that our station is a mere few blocks away from the Capitol. Um, we've been there in Madison broadcasting for 35 years, um, but as many people said, the station was really built for a time like this. We, I got back on the 14th, which was Valentine's Day, the day the, the Valentines were delivered by the graduate students, by the TAA, and we started our coverage nonstop every day um, on our local evening newscast. Um, we have a daily talk show that we started booking guests on. We have a morning show. Um, we had a lot of our music DJs interrupt their programming with breaking news, and people flocked to the station. People were calling. The phone was ringing off the hook, and. Then other stations started calling us um, around the country. A lot of the Pacifica stations, um, some independent stations, producers started coming and uh, broadcasting out of our studios. We had uh, Laura Flanders and Red TV. We had Democracy Now! We had a lot of independent producers. We had the BBC calling us, wanting to know what was happening. And people really, as they started to look at the print covered, they started to look at, at you know some of the um, mainstream media. Um, and realizing that uh, it, 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 didn't really, it didn't cut it, you know, they were living it. You know, it's one thing to look at a story where you don't, you know, you don't know. You don't know any better um, whether the coverage is slanted or whether it just leaves, you know, glaring omissions out. But when you're living the story, when you're waking up and looking at the Capitol and looking at right outside your window, you know, the tens of thousands of people that are protesting and, you, you're, you're realizing that they're not union thugs, and you know there there aren't palm trees in Wisconsin, and all of those things. You know, you know as as um, people were joking uh, in Wisconsin, uh, Fox News ran um, uh, 
pictures of protests, you know, violent protests, and they, you know, they didn't say it explicitly. It wasn't so bold as to say, you know, the, these are the people causing violent protests, but they just talked about it, and then they showed footage, um, and they showed people, you know, pushing and, and, and shoving, and, uh, you know, it kind of led you to leap to the conclusion that, you know, oh, this was, you know, this is this angry mob, which is this meme that they've put out, you know, since day one and continues now in the courtroom battles. You have the, de the department testifying that, you know, their security was compromised and they had to do these measures, you know, unprecedented measures to lock down the Capitol because their security was at stake and our legislators, they were being threatened and death threats and all of this stuff. So this is the meme that they're putting out there constantly every day to justify the behavior, this unprecedented behavior. Um, but in this, sh this footage that, uh, from Fox News that people pointed out, you know, it, there were palm trees in the background, right? It was actually Southern California, you know, some totally unrelated demonstration that they dug up to show the picture that they wanted to convey, which is this angry mob idea. So people really saw that. A lot of people that uh, were flipping through the channels or, you know, reading the, the, the daily newspaper and realizing that there was, there was something really significant going on in the media and that independent media grassroots producers were providing a very real picture, a very real and accurate picture of what was happening daily on the ground. And so I think it was a huge, huge lesson for people in Wisconsin and, and hopefully elsewhere um, as to the, the essential nature of independent media. So I was just happy to be a small part of that. Um, and glad that I got phone calls coming in. It's crazy stuff. I do apologize for the madness of what we do. But for the last month of my life, uh, I have uh, gotten up at about 4.30 or 5 in the morning, and I have gone till about 11, 12, sometimes 1, 2 in the morning. And I have done it for a very simple reason. I am a Wisconsinite, a seventh generation Wisconsinite, and my state is under attack. And I am not going to sleep until we beat Scott Walker. Until we beat the people behind him. Until we beat a neoliberal agenda that would shut down our public services, lay off our public workers, lay off our teachers, and destroy, destroy our civil society. I will not let it happen. So, let me tell you what I've seen in Wisconsin. Well, among other things, among other things, I have seen the best posters ever. <laughs> Period, bar none. I knew it was going good on the first big day of protests. This was the first Tuesday. There were about eight to 10,000 people. And a, a guy standing in the crowd, a, an older guy who was a retired state employee, had a sign in Arabic. And I said, well, I, I, I've covered a lot in the Middle East, but I've never read uh, and I don't know how to read that. And he said, oh, it says, uh, Scott Walker stepped down like Mubarak did. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is gonna be very, very good. And uh, it was only trumped a couple days later on a very, very cold day, a little bit uh, close to zero temperature, where I, I saw someone walking with a big sign that said, I thought Cairo would be warmer. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, the humor, the energy, the great spirit of Wisconsinites has come through throughout this demonstration. And it is important to understand that what's worked in Wisconsin and what can work other places is an ability to learn from not just American traditions, not just Wisconsin traditions, but from the world. The fact of the matter is, yes, from the world. The fact of the matter is, what has worked in Wisconsin a month of mass mobilization, massive demonstrations, would not have occurred if Cairo had not have occurred before. That is a fundamental I heard it, I heard it from 
to start, we didn't have to explain to anyone. When they came the first day, and the second day, and the third day, you know, those of us who, who cover politics, who are, you know, we're too punditocracized to be able to think anymore. We just assume, well, someday they're gonna stop coming. And I would say people to people, well, you know, what's up? What's kind of your timeline here? And they'd say, 18 days. <laughs> That's how long they stayed out in Cairo. And, and it was 18 days was, a, was an underpinning of every single early protest. Nobody thought, Oh, we're going to mobilize for a march on Washington, take the bus down, have a demonstration, <laughs> count the people, and leave. No, they thought we're going to mobilize, come down, count the people, and then we're going to go home, sleep a little, and come back the next morning. Yeah. And that's the power. That's the power. And I want to tell you something else. This is something, if you're there, you get it. If you're not, it's harder. Because we don't have a media in this country that covers politics and labor and working people and poor people. We have a media in this country that only pays attention to poor people and working people when they get in the way of rich people. Right. And the fact of the matter is what happened in Wisconsin is poor people and rich people got in the way of rich, uh, poor people and working people got in the way of rich people every day, day after day. And the media started to pay a little bit of attention. But they didn't see the beauty of this thing. I want to tell you about, I want to pay homage to the people who didn't know they couldn't do it. Right? The people who didn't know this was impossible. And I begin with the TAA, the Teaching Assistance Association at the University of Wisconsin. I was out, you know, I, I move in many circles. And I was out with, for dinner with a Democratic state legislator, a very progressive guy, one of the most progressive guys in the legislature, a guy, a Democrat who supported Green, Ben Mansky, for the state legislature. So this guy's not, you know, he's not, not in the mainstream of his party. And now I'm out there being the pundit that I am. And it was the day after this had come down. And I said, Mark, what's going to happen here? And he said, oh, I was over at the union offices. They're in shock. Their jaws hanging down. I said, what's happening in the Capitol? What's the response of the Democratic politicians in the Capitol? Well, they're in shock. Their jaws hanging down. They have no idea what to do, how to respond to such an, a blatant seizure of power, a, an attempt to destroy public sector unions, which is to destroy any sort of progressive politics in Wisconsin. And the public sector unions weren't all that progressive. But at least they would stand up and say, we need schools, we need snowplow drivers, we need social services. That was their radical act. This, union, this effort by the government was going to destroy them, and everybody was like, I don't know what to do. I have no idea what to do. There's not another election for four years. We're going to have to wait. I mean, we just have to hold our breath for four years, hope that you know, we can survive. The next morning, 50 members of the TAA who hadn't been told what they couldn't do went and stood in front of the University of Wisconsin Memorial Union with signs that said, this shall not pass. We oppose this bill and we're going to organize against it and march against it and rally against it. 50 students. That's where it started. And then a few days later, 1,000. And then a day later, 10,000. And then a day later, people who didn't know what they couldn't do. The teachers walking out. I went up to one of the rallies on the day that the teachers walked out. And I thought, well, this is going to be bigger. This could be very interesting. And I couldn't, my car slowed down. Couldn't get up the street. There was something blocking the street. Ten in the morning. The teachers had walked out, yes. But now, walking up the main thoroughfare, East Washington Avenue, was two thousand of their students walking three miles from their school to the Capitol to stand for their teachers. And when I got to the Capitol, two thousand students came from the west side, and then five thousand University of Wisconsin students, all dressed in red and white, the colors of our school, coming to the university from the University of Wisconsin to the Capitol to speak truth to power. It was epic, it was beautiful, and it didn't stop. And it was because 
so many of us, and I know not the people in this room, but I tell you this story because you need to take it back. You need to take it out to the people that you're wrestling with and debating with on these issues. The founders of this republic were imperfect men. There is simply no doubt of that. But the one good thing about them, the one fundamental thing about them is they formed this republic in revolution against a monarchy. They were against an empire that forced its control from afar on them. And so when they wrote the Constitution of the United States, when they wrote the Constitution of the United States, they did not mention corporations. They did not mention how we elect our officials. They didn't outline how you elect local, state, county, municipal elected officials, how you elect governors. They didn't do that. They knew that power would figure out how to organize society to its advantage. And so the best of our founders in that First Amendment simply outlined what we ought to do to hold them to account. And it didn't say wait till the next election. <laughs> what they said was, you have freedom of speech, a right to speak. And they weren't talking about what did you do last night. They weren't even talking about a right to swear, although I have nothing against swearing. They were talking about a right to speak truth to power, to challenge power. And they outlined freedom of the press. They weren't talking about the stenography to power that we see in so much of our mainstream media today. They were talking about a freedom to challenge power with a reporting and with an aggressive, broadly published, Tom Paine influenced demand the power bend to the people. And then, the, most, the best thing of all, the best thing of all, the right to assemble. And I'm going to tell you, man, that is the most under-respected right in the Constitution of the United States. The right to assemble. The right to put thousands of people in the street to say no. And that's what happened in Wisconsin. They used their right to assemble to petition for the redress of grievances. They did it outside the Capitol, and then they went inside the Capitol. They filled that building. I don't know if you have ever been with 10,000 people in a building, all of them chanting an injury to one is an injury to all. But I will tell you, no politician can miss that sound. And when those Democratic legislators walked out, they were not, as Sarah so well illustrated, they were not the paragons of progressive virtue. They walked out because they did hear that sound. And this is the one thing I will tell you to take away from Wisconsin. We have great debates. How much do we do electoral? How much do we do the street? How much do we do, you know, organizing versus mobilization? All legitimate questions, valid questions. But at that core, when we organize or mobilize, what we must recognize is our power is physical. Our power is in the great mass of us to come together, no matter who is in that office, who is in that station of public power, and to say no. And that's what has to come from Wisconsin. A new vision in every state that when they come for our rights, we do not wait for the next election. We do what I saw Wisconsinites do. And then in the night they were trying to pass that bill. People grabbed their babies and ran from their homes. Drivers pulled their cars up on the curb and they ran to the capital of their state. And they ran into that capital shouting, shame, shame, shame. They filled that capital. And they did so in the very best of American radical traditions and the very best of international radical traditions. They put people power against political power. They did not wait for the next election. They did not wait for the next day. They put themselves in the streets. And when we do that in Wisconsin, in Indiana, in Michigan, in Ohio, and across this country, we will stop the assault on public employees we will stop the assault on our teachers. We will stop the assault on our 
public sector workers and our private sector workers, and we will begin to frame out, frame out what our previous speakers so well outlined, a new vision of the American experiment that does not make apologies for saying that there can be no political democracy until there is economic democracy. Right. Thank you very much.